<clears throat> Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's event at the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum, uh, hosted by the Institute of Politics at Harvard Kennedy School. We are very fortunate tonight to be joined by John Hennessy and David Gergen for this fall's Edwin L. Godkin Lecture. The Godkin Lecture began at Harvard in uh, 1903. Uh, that was long before the Kennedy School came into existence. Um, the Godkin Lecture uh, is named in honor uh, of Edwin Godkin, who was a 19th century Irish-born American journalist who founded the political and cultural magazine, The Nation, and was editor-in-chief of the New York Evening Post. That first lecture was introduced by Charles William Eliot, then the president of Harvard, uh, and President Eliot uh, introduced the lecture by saying uh, that Edwin Godkin uh, should be remembered for his remarkable vigor and great candor and unremitting devotion to lofty ideals of public duty. More than 100 years later, the ideals of public duty remain a central focus of Harvard uh, and, of course, of the Kennedy School and the Godkin Lecture. Today, as I said, we are very fortunate to be joined uh, by a Godkin Lecturer who has distinguished himself in public duties of many sorts. John Hennessy is a renowned computer scientist who shared the 2017 Turing Award for his work on so-called reduced instruction set computer uh, or risk architecture. Uh, he's founded uh, some computer companies, served on the board of many others. Uh, he also served in a number of leadership roles at Stanford University, culminating in being the president of Stanford from 2000 to 2016. Uh, John Hennessy is now the James F. and Mary Lynn Gibbons Professor of Computer Science and Electrical Engineering at Stanford. Uh, and he is the director of Stanford's Knight Hennessy Scholars Program, which we will hear much more about this evening. We are honored and delighted that John Hennessy has accepted our invitation to be this fall's Godkin Lecturer. We're also lucky tonight to be joined by David Kurgan. Uh, David is a professor of public service at the Kennedy School uh, and the director for roughly 20 years of our Center for Public Leadership. During his uh, long time at the Kennedy School, David has been committed to helping students become the principled and effective public leaders uh, that the world needs. And his devotion to this cause has led to significant increases in financial aid for students and tremendous expansions in the leadership training opportunities that we offer. So we are grateful to David for joining us tonight, uh, grateful to John Hennessy. Uh, tonight, uh, David and John will discuss uh, the challenges facing universities and the world today, uh, and really whatever is on their very inquiring minds. So please join me in welcoming John Hennessy and David Kurgan. <laughs> thank you, Doug, and uh, thanks everyone else. But Doug, I especially want to thank you for your own leadership of the Kennedy School. You've been a strong, effective leader very focused and we're fortunate to have you at the helm. Uh, tonight, of course, as you say, we, we welcome John Hennessy to our community. Uh, I've admired him for years. He, he has had many different lives in effect uh, and he's excelled at all of them, especially as president of Stanford for 16 years, as Doug pointed out. He was the, it was his vision to create a program that's now become the, the Knight Hennessy Scholars Program. Uh, it was he was he recognized that there were failures of leadership in many parts of our society and indeed across the world, and that Sanford ought to do, be doing doing more to uh, raise the next generation of global leaders. Uh, very important. They wanted them to be global, and that program has taken off uh, um, uh, really magically under under John Hennessy. He. I might add, because we're all drooling about this here at the Kennedy School, he went out uh, and talked to his friend Phil Knight at Nike and raised $400 million and then went out to others and raised another 350 And that $750 million endowment is, at the, is, is what keeps the Knight Hennessy program right at the center of things in the university. They also built the Denning Building, which is right it's smack in the middle of the university for those scholars. So we will be talking more about this. But obviously, in talking about leadership, we have to talk about the crises in which we find ourselves engulfed today, whether in this country or others. And whether it's the pandemic or the jobless crisis that's come out of that, or, 
or indeed whether it's the racial disparities that we've now come to recognize and, if, and we are taking much more seriously as we should, but still they, they, they are urgent that we deal with that. We have the storms that are coming in, once in a, once in a century type storms, once in a century type fires. And at the middle of all of this, we have a presidency during a presidential campaign, which is crumbling before our eyes. Uh, I, I must say, I have I worked in the Nixon White House, and I can't remember anything that approaches what we're going through since the final days of the Nixon administration. We'll have to see where it comes out. We all pray for the president's health and for that of his first lady. Uh, but we're in a we're in a very difficult period. And I'd like to start John Hennessy by asking you, when we look back, how are we going to remember this period? Where, how did we, how did this all this happen, and how in the world do we get out of it? Over to you, John Hennessy. Yeah, David, that's a good question. Um, it's not that we haven't had other periods that were very contentious in our history, but you know, you mentioned you mentioned Nixon. I, uh, one of the things we did was we looked back at the Nixon Kennedy debate, mm -hmm. and it is a it is a debate of decorum, of politeness, of civic responsibility. Um, not, uh, not like the debates we've had, either of the two debates uh, mm -hmm. so far. I think we've become overly partisan. I think parts of our political process tend to pull us apart rather than together. Um, many Americans are in the middle on many issues, and yet the parties seem to pull them apart. I think we've also done some things that are really destructive. Um, elected individuals who think they only need to represent the people who voted for them, rather than all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember talking to one of our one of our alums who had served in the Senate for more than 24 years, and he said, "When I first went to the Senate, I was asked to represent the people of my state and the country. Mm -hmm. Now I'm asked to represent the people who are in my party and not the rest of those." And I think that's very destructive. We have to rebuild democracy. We have to continue to evolve it. And I think that's going to be crucial. Uh, we, we're an experiment. We're only a little over 200 years old. Well, uh, let's see if we can build another 200 years on top of this. Yeah, I recently um, had a set of conversations with the two historians, um, John Meacham and Michael Betchloss. And we talked about how much of a threat is democracy under. And I must tell you, as historians, I was surprised how bleak they were. Uh, because it, it is true that we have recovered from most of the crises of the past and done done so peacefully. Only once did we really uh, not get there, of course, with the Civil War. Uh, but there, they just had a very dark view. George Kearns Goodwin argues that we haven't seen a polarization of this magnitude since the 1850s, uh, and we all know how that turned out. So, I, I, why is this? Some, why does this seem so much worse? 80% of Americans think events are out of control. And yeah. they're scared. Uh, and one of the things that's going on in this election is people are angry. You know, they're really, really deeply angry. And you're going to see that those votes showing up on both sides of the aisle here in the next few weeks. So I, again, where did we lose our way? Does it say something about what, the way we prepared leaders in the past? Or are these forces we could not foresee? I, I'm just not sure how to think about it. You know, here, one of the issues which I have to um, say is a factor, and as a, as a person who's been in the tech industry, I think mm -hmm. the social media revolution has actually accelerated. Not that those things weren't there before. Mm -hmm. You look at the Jefferson Adams campaign, right? The, very, the first mm -hmm. campaign for the presidency after Washington steps down, it was bitter. They, Jefferson was hiring people to write hit pieces on Adams. Mm -hmm. So, but... What's happened now in the internet age is your reach and your, the speed at which information comes at you, whether that information is true or false. And yeah. I, I think we didn't, uh, those of us in the tech industry didn't foresee this downside to social well, media, quite frankly. Well, that, 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 that's really interesting. Did you just say, just, it was no re reason to believe that it would take off like this. Yeah, and it's made the, we've, we already had it to some extent with cable news. Right. Well, there aren't many people who watch both Fox and MSNBC. Those are right. non-overlapping communities. We try to get them to CNN, actually. Go ahead. Yeah, CNN. <laughs> CNN is maybe the closest that we have to that. But I think what's happened with social media is you can, you can make very fine bubbles. So if what you care about is access to guns, you can find a bubble of people where that's all they care about. Yeah. And it, it's, really, it's really balkanized us. 
Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the Kennedy-Nixon debates because they were very special earlier in our lives. We, we all, you know, tuned in, especially for that first debate. Uh, and so much of history turned on that, those debates. And today, it's just in the last 24 hours, um, uh, we've learned, we, we, it's been recalled that the third of those debates were done remotely. Absolutely. Uh, and they did, and they worked very well. And everybody <laughs> felt it was, they were good, solid debates. And so uh, it, it seems to me that's a pretty flimsy reason not to do it. You know, this time we can come back to that. But this must have given you, you must have been thinking while you were president of Stanford, that something is amiss here, that we're going off the rails in a way we shouldn't have. And is that what led to the Knight Hennessy program? Tell us about the origins. And then I think I think our audience would really love to hear more about the program itself. Yeah, that, that was the beginning of it, David. I think this was obviously before the 2016 election, but we could already see the deadlock occurring in Congress. Right. And, and uh, similarly, what was happening in Europe, you know, we saw the collapse of the Arab Spring, which I think many of us saw as an opportunity to build democracies, a largely collapse. Uh, Europe was stuck in the refugee crisis. The beginning uh, drumbeat of Brexit was just beginning. Mm -hmm. But we also had corporate failures. I think 2008, 2009, I don't think Wall Street distinguished themselves. Right. Uh, they had to save things, but they got to a situation they never had, never should have been in, in the first right. place. So I think we were, I saw this and then I started thinking, well, my first thought was I should retire from the presidency, go on a few boards and, and rest a lot more. And, <laughs> and a close colleague said to me, you're not gonna be happy if you're just doing a bunch of this and a little of this, a little of that. You should try to think about, do you have one more big thing you could, you could do? Um, and I knew that Phil Knight was concerned about uh, leadership in government, but in the corporate world as well. And so I said to Phil, well, what do you think about this idea? And Phil said, that's a great idea. That would be terrific. I said, okay, Phil, I need $400 million. <laughs> 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 and he said, give me a month to think about it. And, and we agreed after a month later that, um, that he would do it and I would agree to be the initial director. Uh huh. And so when you got to 400, why did you think you needed to go out and do anything more? <laughs> I told him I told him I wanted half of the total money. So 750 million for the endowment and 50 million to build the building and and start the program up. So I see. Terrific. Terrific. And yeah. And so tell us about the program itself and the scholars that you've been attracting. So we we bring in scholars from around the world and also highly interdisciplinary. These Basically, are not academics. They're, these are students. These are students. Right. They're doing their graduate work. Right. Uh, and they can study in any graduate program in the university. So we have a mix. It's it's about forty percent PhD students, forty percent professional students, so MBAs, MDs, and JDs, and about twenty percent of them are in policy programs, international policy, public policy, uh, health policy, things of that form, education policy. Um, and they come from all over the United States, small schools, big schools, all over the, and, and around the world. Um, it's, uh, it's an incredibly diverse group um, and they are learning and building and understanding how to lead um, together. So each class, yeah, each class is a size and then how many applications are you getting then? So we, we uh, last year we had about 6,800 applications for mm -hmm. a class of 76 we took. Mm -hmm. And we're slowly ramping up to 100 over time. Oh, wow. So you're probably going to get over 80,000 too. Maybe yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get a lot. I, I suspect we'll get a few more. <laughs> yeah, so it's really hard to get into this program. It's extremely competitive. You've it's got to, you've to get two different acceptances from competitive schools. You do. You have to be accepted by your department program and you and we're looking for different things. So there's a, our part of the application asks about, tell us about your demonstrated leadership. Tell us about how you're thinking about your life plan um, and, and give us letters of reference that attest to your character and, and the kind of person you are. Mm -hmm. And what do you hope they will do when they are finished? So I hope they'll go, we pick people who seem to have a deep commitment to doing uh, doing civil good, good in the world. So some of them will go on to be academics. 
Mm -hmm. Some of them will go into government. I'm, I'm certain of that. We've already have a few people. Who've, we have somebody who's already served. We have several people who served in government. We have a number of people who are uh, coming out of the service academies who are going to go back into the military after their graduate work. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we'll get some people into the corporate world as well over time. But it sounds like they're, they're going to use, anticipate the corporate side will be, uh, won't be over 50%. It'd be much less than that. No, it'll be less than that, I suspect. Even among our even among our law school students, I expect many of them will go into public service kinds of law right. careers. And do you expect many to go into nonprofits? I do. So we already have some nonprofits started. We have we have about two or three nonprofits that have, the scholars have already gotten up yeah. and running. And some of those will scale and become major commitments for them after they graduate. Right. So these these students, when they come in and they're in this, they're in a cohort together. Uh, 70, 80, 90, whatever that's going to wind up being 100. Uh, and then you have a special building for them. Uh, it doesn't have uh, living facilities, but it has all sorts of dining facilities and rooms where you can uh, have meetings and gatherings. And it's right smack in the middle of the campus, a wonderful spot in that campus. Um, and then, but what's also interesting is it's a co-curricular program. It's not part of the regular curriculum. So if you go to the law school, for example, you, you, you take the law school classes and this is extra on top. That's correct. It's extra on top. And we try to make compelling things that, and we try not to duplicate what the schools or departments will do, but to bring other perspective to there. I, I see. And what is it, you know, we all look at the military academies and we sort of, we, we know what the theory of the case is in the military academy. We know what they, how they think they should prepare leaders. One of the things we've been, we talk about a lot at the county schools, how, you know, how do you, in the civilian world, when you don't have somebody, you know, all summer you can put out in the field and be going through military exercises, you know, but sort of disappear over the summer. Um, how do you, how do you, how do you actually prepare people for leadership? What do you, what is the, what's the magic formula from your point of view? Well, I think it's, it, it is about building a set of experiences and mm -hmm. leadership. I, I've always believed that leadership is just something you learn by climbing a ladder one rung at a time. Uh -huh. And it's, it's very hard to skip the rungs uh, over time because you don't learn how to master some particular, whether it's delivering a difficult message to somebody or inspiring a group of people to work together or dealing with an ethical challenge. Mm -hmm. um, so we try to build those kinds of experiences, both by having visitors to come in and talk about their experience and talk about what they went through and how they made decisions. Mm -hmm. um, as well as workshops and retreats to to uh, put them in front of real problems. Right. Here's a real problem that needs a solution. Work as a team on this. So in your in your book, Leadership Matters, a splendid book. I'm, I'm, I recommend it to everyone. Um, the uh, you talk about the sort of foundational characteristics or or values or qualities, uh, and you you have four there that you that you uh, focus on and and you might just hand in plus courage as a fifth sort of umbrella uh, you might I'd, I'd be interested in hearing please tell everyone what, what that that because it seems to me you must start with that foundation or that that we do, we do start with that so and yeah. i you know when i was putting the book together i, I was uh, wrestling with the order of the chapters right and after the 2016 election i decided humility needed to be chapter one <laughs> <laughs> i can't imagine why i can't imagine who might have spurred you on <laughs> yeah <laughs> and, and i felt you know what, what i said in the what i said in the book is humility gives you the courage to ask for help when you need it to realize uh -huh. you're not the smartest person in the room on all subjects mm -hmm. <laughs> but that great, great leadership is great, is building and, and, and inspiring great teams. And right. humility's, humility's uh, clear to that um, right. and a, a clear quality that you need. So, so you had that, you had authenticity. Authenticity, which goes with trust, trust because right. you have to build the, uh, the trust of the team. Right. There, now, a lot of the work that's done on authenticity and talks about true north and you know, sticking to your true north. north. It, it's it's more it seems more about you and your values. You go to your values. You go to yourself, and you, it's how to be true to yourself. But you take it in a somewhat different direction. The argument is somewhat different direction. It's not just true to yourself. It's true to others, to your community, to the values of your organization. So it's just not all about who am I and I go inside to look at myself. It is rather what do I owe others? What am I called to do? If if, if you would. 
Right. And I think that's really true. I think you've got to think about what is your role as a leader leading the team and what, 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 are, the, what are the core values that you're mm-hmm. going to stick to when things get tough? Yeah. Now, another of your values was empathy. Uh, and you, made a, you, you talked a lot about that. How do you teach people to be empathic? I think we try to teach them by bringing them into circumstances where they can understand somebody else's struggle and, mm-hmm. and hear about it and see it um, and see the grit and determination that it took. Um, right. Early on, when we bring our scholars together, um, we bring them together for a breakfast or a lunch once a week. And we have them talk about various challenges in their lives. Mm. Uh, and it, after a few weeks, once people get comfortable with one another, they talk about really difficult circumstances that they've gone through. Yeah. And to have a fellow scholar, to have somebody who is your peer um, explain that creates a completely different kind of experience, I think. So it's the telling of stories. Yeah, it's the telling of stories. Yeah, we have someone that uh, you, you've met at uh, the Kennedy School, Marshall Gans is on the faculty there. And he has one of the most popular courses in the school. It's all about narrative, personal narrative and sharing stories uh, and letting people become more vulnerable with each other and then finding places where you can be, you can be both private and trust, trust other, others with your story. So it doesn't become an object of ridicule or make you vulnerable or anything. And it, it seems to, there seems to be a great appetite for that among the young. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think it's a, it's a, look, we've all made mistakes. We've all had, even those of us that are successful have had crises and mistakes along the way. Being able to share that and talk about that, I think uh, really helps other people see that it wasn't all uh, a bed of roses. Yeah, yeah, you, it, it's interesting. There are a couple of times that you, you got knocked around yourself. You got knocked down and that, that yeah. seemed to give you more humility. But early on in your business career, when you started the company and you hired too many people and then you had to go fire, uh, what, 40 yeah, people? We, fire people. We, we, we wouldn't have made payroll in two weeks. We would have been out of money. And right. it, was a, it was a crisis. But, yeah. you know, ha- having survived that, the next time you're better at navigating the next one that comes along. Right. Well, that was interesting how you made decisions in, uh, in the 2008-09 recession when you really had a financial crunch and you who who had to take the hit. Can you walk us through that? Because it reflected how you turned to your values uh, in order to solve difficult problems. Yeah, well, we did. We, we um, uh, like many of our institutions, we lost a lot of money and a lot of, a lot of our cash vaporized in that. And we lost about a third of our endowment. I think mm-hmm. similar kind of number to what Harvard lost. Right. Um, and so we had to make cuts. So we first thing we decided was what would be protected. And we decided we were not going to cut faculty and we were not going to cut financial aid for students because we could see that for families, this was going to be, there was going to be economic repercussions from the crisis and families would need more financial aid, probably not less. We actually underestimated how much more they needed. Um, So we had another hit there, but we decided right away, we're not going to cut those. Um, the provost and I took a pay cut and we asked all the senior leadership to take a pay cut. And then we made an announcement. We were going to, we were going to have to do layoffs. Um, and we were going to have a one month, two month planning process. We're going to announce them. And then we're going to be all done with it and get through the, get through the tunnel, the darkness as quickly as possible was the strategy. But, but the administrators could take the hit. I mean, it, it was difficult, but still, but it was the right call. It was the right call. Yeah, it was the right call. The essential values. You know, it was a difficult circumstance because lots of my faculty colleagues said, well, why don't you just spend out the, down the endowment? And I pointed out, we've already spent down the endowment. We've already spent it down. We, 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 the question is, are we going to spend it to the point where we right. hamper the university for the next 10 years rather than, rather than the next year? Right, right. So Stanford has become a really hot school obviously and you know many people from the east look look longingly at Sanford and wonder if they should go there but it's it's always a big big attraction how do you distinguish Stanford and the kind of a culture civic culture from say east coast schools that you're familiar with whether it's MIT or Harvard or Yale or whatever it may be well probably these institutions have far more in common than they have that mm-hmm. distinguishes them uh, right. we all have we all have 
a focus on excellence and quality that I think pervades, uh, pervades all our institutions. You know, California feels different because it is the West Coast. It's, right. it's, it's the kind of, uh, we, we are the pioneering institution. Uh, right. Started out in the, in the wilderness, which it was the wilderness when we started. Yeah. We're, we're newer. And mm -hmm. some of the thing, because we're newer, we were created with a different ethos, right? We were co-educational from the beginning. We had certain uh, different things. We embraced both, both the practical side of things as well as the more theoretical, uh, esoteric uh, side of things. And that was, that was something the Stanford's wanted in the institution. Mm -hmm. So my, my sense of John, I may be wrong, but that you yourself have a very entrepreneurial spirit you know, you started companies long before you became a major academic and, and then ran Stanford and were also provost. So you had long before all that uh, and you were you, and you learned how to take risks. It was part of your makeup. And it's I, I was struck in the book, your book, about the idea that it was central to what kind of presidency you had. And that is you were willing to take risks as president of Stanford and you were willing sort of to take the and also go with a long view and not a short view. Uh, and that those two things really distinguish you uh, from a lot of universities. Universities, as you know so much better than I do, the, the officialdom in universities can be uh, less than a quote, let us say, efficient. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 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 I, mean, I, I find it ironic, David, that universities where faculty have to constantly reinvent themselves to stay at the cutting edge of their field, and right. yet in terms of changing the structure or how they do something, they are among the most conservative institutions. Exactly. Maybe only government is more conservative. <laughs> um, so I, you know, and I, th I, I think the trustees, when they selected me as president, realized that I was not going to be a caretaker, uh, that my background and experience had been go for something, go for something big and, and stretch yourself as an institution. Go, go big or go home. Right. Yeah. And, but it's a, but your board has been willing to support you on that. They did, they did. And I think the other thing we could, we could get the resources. I mean, I think a big vision uh, generates excitement about where you're going and we got the faculty on board and we right. got the ability to do it. Yeah, I, I, I think we should not leave this conversation without people understanding that the Knight Hennessy program is splendid, but it would be it would be inappropriate to see this as some sort of elitist departure from the rest of the university. In fact, you spend a lot of your time raising money for financial aid and for for uh, permitting students, and enabling students to come who might who never otherwise have been there. Yeah, you might, you might That's absolutely right. That. So if you look at our budget, all, almost all our money goes to student support. More than eighty percent of our funding goes directly to support students, their tuition and their their living stipend. And right. we have students. Uh, we have students who not only come from around the world, but parts of the U.S. and um, ha ha some students who have really had to overcome significant hardships in their life. And a lot of them who would say, you know, if it weren't for this program, because I want to go into nonprofit practice. Without this program, I cannot fulfill the dream I want. Uh huh. Uh, that's that's interesting. Now, if a student were to come to you, sort of high school kid, 16, 17 year old high school kid, he's he's got the got the scores and he's got the desire to come to Stanford, and he wants to be a public leader. Should he come there and study tech, or should he come there and study the arts? You really had a or study the liberal arts. Uh, you have a have a flourishing arts program that you started as well. Yeah. So certainly they, he should have a liberal arts education. I'm a, a deep believer in a liberal arts education and. Yeah to that. So I think broadly educated, understand history and culture as well as technology. Clearly technology is shaping a lot of what we do now and um, affects a lot of what we do. I hope that we're educating technology leaders who think deeply about the implications of their technology, mm -hmm. uh, particularly as we move into this AI era. It's going to be right. absolutely crucial. So these issues that we're dealing with now are just the beginning. Just beginning. Right, right, right. But you are a believer uh, then, say, if, if someone uh, comes there and wants a liberal arts education and then wants to go get a master's degree in computer science or something like that, that that, is a, that can be a good path. Yeah, it can be a good path. It's not an easy path. It requires somebody, just as right. you see many students who get a, 
liberal arts education then decide to go to med school really need to take some time to prepare themselves. Um, since Harvard is one of the largest sources we have for uh, incoming Knight Hennessy scholars, I could tell them go to Harvard and get an education there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, the, um, <laughs> we're going to start turning to uh, student questions now. Uh, if I might, I think that we'll see how the system works, but I would like to call on Julia from the college. Hi, um, I'm a first year here at the college and I was just wondering, um, you talked a little bit about like some of the various aspects that like a leader requires, like humility and empathy. Um, and I was wondering how do you think like you can build these skills in a classroom that's not necessarily oriented for leadership, but how could you still find ways and meaningful ways within a classroom to sort of simulate this and build these characteristics? It's probably harder in a classroom. Uh, we, we try to teach these through experiential encounters of various sorts. Uh, it may be bringing in a speaker, it may be talking to somebody who's been through a leadership journey, it may be talking to one of their fellow scholars. I think those experiential learning capabilities uh, complement traditional classroom kinds of experiences. And, and I think for leadership, you need both. You, you do, you think you need both? Yeah, I think you need both. Okay. There are certainly there are certainly classroom based skills that leaders need, whether it's whether they're in the corporate or the government setting. Absolutely. They need those. But they they also need these other uh, these other kinds of skills and abilities. OK, good. William from Harvard Business School. Hi, uh, thank you very much for being here. Um, I know you've talked a little bit about how the internet and social media has amplified a lot of voices, especially around the election. And we're in the middle of uh, trying to see how social media will play a factor uh, in this election. You've also said Silicon Valley is replaceable and the DOJ has launched a few investigations. I was, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what role you see um, Alphabet and some of the other companies playing in this current election and moderating uh, news and, and fake news and things of that sort, as well as uh, how you think a replacement of Silicon Valley could interact with uh, these sorts of issues. You know, I think there are a lot of issues around the social media space. I mean, Section 230 uh, of the Communication Decency Act, which basically enabled the internet to flourish by making it internet service providers not responsible for verifying content, also unleashed lots of things which we didn't anticipate. I think you find yourself a bit caught in a conundrum, namely, it probably is the case that you can't ask a company to be the arbiter of truth. Um, that's extremely difficult and truth is very nuanced. You know, it's one thing to say, um, well, the statement that Obama was, is not a US citizen is false. It's another thing to say, well, there may be multiple causes for climate change. Um, Cause there are clearly scientists who believe there are causes beyond uh, just fossil fuels. So th there's caution about this. I think we're seeing some movement with respect to, to hate speech and various forms of hate speech and banning that. But I'd say there are politicians who are concerned about that because groups that may support them may be more prone to engaging in those kinds of activities. So the companies are trying to, uh, I find it fascinating that Republicans and Democrats are asking for two different things from the social media companies, right? Republicans are asking for a greater presence for conservative voices why Democrats are asking to have uh, to have statements on the internet verified somehow for truth. The companies are trying to weave a, a, a course through that right now and figure out what makes sense. Um, and even though they are not bound by First Amendment rules, there's some context of, uh, in the US, we don't like to regulate speech. So that, that provides a context they're trying to negotiate. With respect to the Valley, you know, the Valley is the home of creative destruction. It has been creative destruction all along and companies come and fall with new technologies. And I think we're not, technology is still evolving. Um, and so we, we're going to see more new young companies created. And I think concerns about antitrust are going to inhibit uh, what might have been mergers before. 
Uh, and so some of these uh, new young companies will have the opportunity to grow into giants, just as the companies did before them. Yeah, let me follow that up, John, with a question about disinformation. How do, you know, the, the, the erosion of trust in all institutions has got to be very significant. And then we come into these you know, campaign seasons and it's amplified by what appears to be international, you know, efforts to, uh, to uh, and disinform us or to erode trust in government still further. How do we, how do we regulate that without becoming uh, heavy handed in the government? Well, I, th I think, David, as you know, we regulate political advertising through right. broadcast media. There's no reason that we couldn't, we couldn't regulate political advertising on the <laughs> Internet. And I think we should be thinking about regulations, particularly one of the most insidious things on the Internet is using micro-targeting in political advertising. Mm -hmm. uh, and that enables you to target very narrow groups on the basis of, right. of highly special character and creates a... a an echo chamber wall garden effect that I think is extremely divisive. Mm -hmm. I, I think we should be regulating those things. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and companies should be responsible for verifying who's buying uh, advertising services on their, uh, on their source. But they could, they could use a cutout or something like that, can't they? They could, they could still, you can still get around it. Um, you can still get around it. This is the problem in the internet age. You can find a way to bypass these things. Uh, n not that differently than how PACs bypass certain right. campaign right. spending regulations. Right. Good. Let's go back to the uh, to the uh, student and uh, the audience. Alex. Um, hi. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm Alex. I'm a sophomore at the college. Um, and earlier on in the conversation, we were talking a little bit about political polarization and how a lot of politicians now kind of lead for the people who voted for them instead of all of their constituents. So I'm just kind of curious what you think about um, what politicians, political leaders, and just everyday people can do to kind of bring people back to the center and end this era of polarization that we have. Well, I think the first thing is vote, vote. I, I'm in favor of a change to the, to the national laws that require you to vote. And you can do it the way Australia does it, for example. Namely, you pay a fine if you don't vote. Um, I think that would be a helpful way to do it. I think open primaries are another important thing to get away from some of the uh, divisiveness that exists. Um, and as you know, uh, California, California may know, California uh, passed an open primary law and they got sued by the two parties who wanted to control the primaries. Um, I think open primaries enable people who cross boundaries and who might collaborate and cross the aisle and work uh, with, with somebody on the other side uh, much better. That would be a way to begin to reduce some of that polarization. Um, we unfortunately have a, a constitution which biases us to a two-party system. And if you go back and look at the history of what's happened when there were more than two parties, uh, there was a lot of chaos with respect to who got elected. We had, we had a number of contingent elections um, and that's, I think, unfortunate because it doesn't, it, it tends to polarize on these two parties and they tend to get pushed towards the polls rather than pulled towards the middle. Um, uh, constitutional amendments are very hard to do, so I'm not sure we can fix that by a constitutional amendment. Um, and besides, I, if I was going to fix something, I'd probably fix the Electoral College first and foremost. <laughs> take, take 30 more seconds on the Electoral College. What would you do? So I think there are two problems in the electoral college. Uh, one is that our votes are not equal anymore. Uh, a voter in Wyoming um, has about 1.6, 1.7 times the voting strength of a voter in California uh, because of the, the lower bound. Uh, roughly half the states benefit from that. So it's very hard to fix it. Um, mm -hmm. They have fewer than seven electoral votes or fewer, and they benefit from the minimum number, which is, which is three. Um, so that, that's a problem. The other problem with the Electoral College is that the states, most states now uh, block vote their Electoral College votes. Um, and that, that tends to create greater discrepancies. If you have a state that's very close, um, I take Kennedy Nixon. Um, Kennedy won the popular vote by 0.17%. 
but he won significantly in the electoral college because he won some big states, Texas in particular, uh, that swung it across the boundary. So that some people argue that's a good thing. I think more recently, um, the way political elections have been held, you see political parties, you see candidates playing just to the states that are in the in the jump ball category. Nobody comes to California. No Republicans come to California, uh, so that's a that's not a good thing. Right. <clears throat> what is the the mood on your campus among students now? We uh, as we approach an election night that may be chaotic, and until very recently it appeared it could be violent. Um, that, that may, I think the chances of that happening are lessening. If Biden builds up a big lead, which he has now done so far, if it, and if he keeps that lead, then it may be a decisive victory. And I think the chances of having recounts and everything like that disappear. But on the other hand, if it comes in at a very close election, we're almost guaranteed to have lots and lots of legal challenges and lots and lots of unrest. Yeah. I think um, people were shocked in the 2016 election, I think. And there are people who felt, uh, particularly students, particularly uh, students of color, who felt that that election was really uh, a terrible event for the country. Mm -hmm. um, to the extent that they felt like that was not their president and not their country. Right. I, I think I worry about a repeat of this. I mean, we repeated this especially um, with everything we've learned in the last four years would just further divide the country. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that's, what, that's what I think we really worry about. And we've got some big problems. Lisa. We've got the pandemic. We have climate change. Um, we have issues around immigration that I think mm -hmm. all need serious attention. Right. And so the students themselves at your campus, uh, they are, are, you, are you going mostly remote? I mean, I know you're not in your building, so it must be remote. Yeah, we're remote. Yeah, across much of the campus. So it's probably harder to judge student sentiment. It is harder to judge it. It is harder to judge it. I mean, it, it um, you know, normally you would see it just walking around on campus, but here it's harder. Yeah, good. Let's go to Troy. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. Thank you, David. Thank you, John. Uh, I am Troy McDonald, as you mentioned. I am a student at the Extension School getting a master's degree in government. Um, I'm happy that I'm kind of coming in right now after Alex's question and your point, John, about kind of African Americans and people of color. Um, you talked about party policy party polarization earlier uh, in regards to kind of how the country is split. And you can look at kind of the early tracings of that in the late 1960s with the passage of the civil rights bills. In fact, uh, John, President Johnson famously said uh, that they lost the South for the generation uh, after passing uh, those bills. So I'm curious about what you're doing with your scholars and the people that you're working with to kind of create empathy, because it's one thing to create that structural change, but until we can touch people's hearts, it's really hard to kind of tackle this issue uh, of racism and the feeling that if other people get a slice of the pie, that hurts me and my family and white families in particular. So I'm curious about your thoughts on that and thank you for the conversation. Yeah, thank you. It's a great question. I think we we are trying both to uh, get students to understand this through personal contacts, through encounters they have with speakers, with fellow students, but also to understand some of the history. Um, racism did not end with the Civil War. The, the collapse of Reconstruction and the rise of Jim Crow um, actually continued that legacy and spread it for many more years. And the North wasn't immune either. So we, we talk about areas, and we, we, we talked about areas in California where there was redlining, where African Americans could not get mortgages in these neighborhoods. So I think there's a global, there's a responsibility which isn't just belong in the South. It has its special transgressions, but, but the problem is much more deeply uh, rooted. And I think we, we're trying to grapple with that problem and ask, how do we move forward and how do we remove the legacy of racism and white supremacy that um, that has existed in, in the country? I'm hopeful. I see I see young people. They have a very different view of things. Um, and as we bring people together and they get to personally meet people who have come from different cultures, different backgrounds, different colors and understand they're people, too. 
they're people too. And they want the same things you want. They want a better life. They want an opportunity for their family. And as they, they break through that boundary, they can understand that we should be working together for that, providing great opportunities for all, for all Americans. Um, I wonder, John, sometimes whether the way to encourage that, especially among the young, is through a, a, a more robust program of national service. That if, that if uh, some of these young people after high school, sometime before college, certainly before the age 25, give a year back to their community. Yeah, I, I agree, David. I think it is one of the most important. You know, it's been an interesting thing about our, uh, about our scholars. While many of our scholars who are headed for PhD come directly out of the undergraduate program, uh, mo many others that we have have been spent a year in a nonprofit or in public service. And I think it, it really, it indicates to us that this person is probably committed to a life of, of giving back to people. Mm -hmm. So you do take that into account. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Good. Because I thought there was a time of 10 or 15 years ago where business schools, for example, didn't care. If you went off and did a year for Teach for America, that was just irrelevant to what they were about. I think applying to business school now, I think uh, spending a year or two in a, in a nonprofit setting um, is more rare than having spent two years in investment banking. And therefore, it's <laughs> worth a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. Uh, let's go to Alice. All right. All right, Alice. All right, I'm here. Uh, thank you so much for hosting and sharing your insights about the book and the wonderful program at Stanford. Um, my name is Alice Zhang. I am a current made career MPA student and the newly elected vice president for, for professional development at the Kennedy School. Uh, your background uh, actually reminds me of the Silicon Valley. That's where I'm, I'm originally from, and I recently moved to Massachusetts. Uh, so my background is in uh, tech venture capital, and I would like to transition into U.S. foreign policy. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, I, as an American citizen, I had the privilege to have the option to move uh, from the Silicon Valley to come to uh, Cambridge uh, to, to study and, you know, have of uh, the social distancing uh, uh, engagements with some of the classmates. And so, Professor, you mentioned that many of the students uh, in the Stanford program are international. Uh, so my, my first question is that uh, I wonder how Stanford is dealing with the current situation to continue to bring international students to the school. And my second question is, uh, in terms of professional development, uh, what advice that you can give uh, to the current and future leaders of the world on how to build effective uh, collaborations between the public, private, and civil sectors and develop collaborative and um, uh, competitive partnerships with other countries? Thank you. Those are both great questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Alice. I think on the first part, um, We've gotten by, but we are worried. Uh, the most recent regulations um, would uh, eliminate student visas for the duration of the degree and students would have to renew them. And from a number of countries, uh, those visas would have to be renewed after two years. And there's not even a guarantee that a student would necessarily be able to renew their visa, even if, for example, if they were in a medical degree program or a, law program or a PhD, they wouldn't be finished at the end of two years, impossible. Uh, so that's really worrisome. I think um, my view is quite simple. Um, immigrants to this country, particularly immigrants who've come initially for their graduate education or their education and stayed on, have become a mainstay of strength in this country, especially in Silicon Valley. So we need to, we need to uh, continue to uh, uh, do that and, and engage those people. With respect to collaboration, I think your question really gets at a really important observation. It's hard to get government to innovate. So to innovate, we may have to have combinations of government working with the NGO sector and maybe even with the for-profit sector. And those kinds of collaborations that we can create that are win-wins for, for everybody in there and win-wins for society are gonna have to be crucial. And we need to do that on the, on the global stage. We shouldn't be trying to destroy the World Health Organization. We be, should be trying to invest in the World Health Organization because the pandemic should have taught us 
We need a stronger World Health Organization, not somebody, not a, a blame. So I think we have to rethink these things and, and think better. I, the, our world is too small for a country to say, we're going to go it alone. We're not going to interact with anybody else. We're going to, you just can't do this anymore. So I think it requires better leadership uh, and, and collaborative leadership to make that work. Terrific. Leadership right out of your program. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we have three more questions, if we might, and then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up. But uh, Bawana, I think I hope pronounced that right. I hope I did. Hi, how are you? Uh, my name's uh, my name's Elijah Devon. I'm a senior at Harvard studying history and literature. I'm really really grateful to be here. I'm actually one of David's research assistants. Uh, it's my it's my side gig. <laughs> um, uh, so right now, kind of, we see all these crises converging. There's ecological catastrophe, a pandemic, reckoning on race, economic devastation. I'm interested, kind of, given your background, you know, what role will higher education specifically play in the years to come? And for students like myself who are still in school I, and hope to pursue other degrees, I, I hope to go to law school, what is it important, what is it important for us to study and, and seek to understand through the academy in the years to come so that we can be the leaders to solve these, these really challenging problems? Well, I think higher education certainly has an important role. I mean, education is the path forward. And if we're going to solve these problems, we're going to have to have people who understand them deeply, but also understand how to build collaborative teams to try to address these problems. Mm -hmm. um, to speak, some of it's speaking truth to power, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Stepping out and, and really making it clear that there's a problem here. Um, I think we're going to, my view, my view is when I, when I talk to young people, they are, despite all the challenges, they're optimistic about making a difference and they're willing to work hard to make that difference. So I think when I look at the next generation, that's why we decided to start this program. We're going to invest in that next generation and help hopefully uh, propel people forward and, and make a better world. And I, you look at examples of people who've done that. I mean, we were we were uh, looking at Brian Stevenson's work recently in our program, right? And uh, the Equal Justice Initiative and what he's done. He's dedicated his life to this, but he has changed um, not just individual lives, but changed the way we think about our criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. And we need we need to do that. We need to step up. We need to find those brave individuals, and, and we as a country need to make heroes of them. We need to realize that they're doing the work. They're doing the work that's going to make us a better country. Yes, sir. Thank you. I appreciate it. T terrific. So I, I want to follow that up a little bit. You could dig a little deeper on that because, John, you've uh, you've said you have boundless optimism in the young. Boundless optimism in the young. <laughs> Can you tell us more about that and what you see there? There, I, I happen to agree with you. I, I find especially people who put on a military uniform and have served or people who've served domestically for a couple of years, uh, they just give you a lot more faith in the future. They, they remind me so much of the World War II generation, especially the young veterans coming back. Uh, and they, they, you know, there's a, there's a sense that millennials are entitled and they're not, they're not really stepping up to it, but that's not what I see. I see, I see young people coming up who are much more promising and give you real hope. Could you, could you talk more about that in your own experiences? Yeah, I, I think I think David. Well, first of all, either I'm optimistic about the younger generation, or we're really in deep trouble. <laughs> so I have to look for. I have to be better. Yeah, um, but I I also find they're willing to rethink problems in different ways, and they're willing to work across these boundaries between government and the nonprofit sector, and even a for-profit uh, corporation. Um, they envision they've grown up in a very different environment than than we grew up in. And I think that exposure to a wider range of people um, has helped them uh, develop better instincts. They're more empathetic. They understand. Yeah. I mean, that there isn't the culture of um, I got mine. I hope you got yours. That 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 exists, too. Um, but there are a lot of young people who want to uh, see themselves on a path. 
uh, that will benefit not only themselves, where they'll be able to do something that, that's rewarding, but will benefit others as well. And that's what we're trying to latch on to. Yeah, good. And, and you think that they, you can light that fire when they're there a couple of years, you can really I help. Think them. We can light it. I think part of the lighting it is selecting the right people. So we right. we have a very careful selection process where we look for evidence of that, and yeah. we find it in different ways. We find it in somebody who started a nonprofit uh, to work with people in the slums of Mumbai. We find it in a young man coming out of the military academy in a leadership mm -hmm. position. Uh, we find it in in a person who you know, grew up in a, in a very, under very difficult, poor circumstances, but really wants to give back and see, see their life uh, yeah. along those lines. Yeah. And, and, and your role now in this, all of this is to try to continue working with that generation to try to mentor some that, you know, I, I think so when I think of you, I think so often of John, Johnny Dorsey. Oh yeah, great. Came, young. To our, came to my doorstep through your letter, and he came to the Kennedy School. He'd been to Stanford, and he went back to Stanford. Uh, but he was terrific at the Kennedy School. We had a wonderful time with him. Yeah, I, I think we, you know, we 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 try to we try to help these people navigate a path and help them. They're they're driven by their own vision of what they want to do in the world. It's not all. It's not our vision. It's their. It's their vision. They're shaping and developing. Our goal is to help mentor them, guide them a little bit, expose them to different viewpoints. And, and hopefully, as I sometimes say, we're trying to take a talented person and push their trajectory a little higher. Yeah. But this really sounds like your purpose in life. It is now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it is I mean, it's, a core, it's a core purpose. It's my core purpose now. It's, it's what I decided I, I do, and it's what I spend the vast majority of my time on. Good, terrific. Well, once again, I I, I think they uh, asked me to, if to let you go, but with, with to let you go with with uh, great uh, appreciation, uh, admiration. Uh, your vision is one I hope will become shared with others, other universities. Nobody else can match what you've done on the fundraising side, but they can match you in spirit, and other colleges and universities can take up this cry too. So I, I, I want to let you know that we in the Kennedy School like to be in the same trenches with you. Um, and we look forward to what, you know, it's always, you know, it's always interesting to keep an eye on Stanford. It's, you, you guys are always doing something really, really interesting. And that's been led by you. So thank you on behalf of everyone who's here. You, we appreciate your time, your, your effort, but especially we appreciate what you're doing to prepare the next generation. Thank you. Thank you, David, Th and thanks for the great discussion and the terrific questions. Terrific, good. Good night. Good night.